Welcome everyone to the module three live session for the ethics around the globe course. Our topics this week are Aristotle's virtue ethics and Buddhism. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And this meeting is being recorded so that you can watch it later at your convenience. So here's a picture of Aristotle. He was one of the three ancient Greek philosophers. Here is a timeline. Uh, we talked about Socrates in module one. He lived in 500 BC in ancient Greece. He never wrote anything down, but he engaged a lot of people in his Socratic method in which he tried to catch people in a contradiction to make them think and show them that they didn't really know how much they thought they knew. He taught Plato, who wrote a lot of things down. Plato also opened a school. Plato taught Aristotle. Aristotle opened a school as well. Plato and Aristotle wrote a great deal about how to live a good life. And um, Aristotle's book is called the Nicomachean Ethics, named after his son. And Aristotle would later um, get the title of the philosopher because he's one of the most important thinkers, at least in Western history. Aristotle's virtue ethics <clears throat> is what we'll be covering this week. Aristotle rejects deontological ethics, which was we talked about um, Kantian ethics in week two, which is said that ethics is just a set of universal moral rules. You simply do your duty and um, there are no exceptions. Aristotle rejects that approach to ethics. We talked about Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism, which said that the morally correct action is the one that leads to the best consequences and minimizes suffering. Aristotle rejects that approach as well. For him, the correct approach is to look at virtue. So our objectives are to explain the basic ideas of a virtue-based ethical theory, describe Aristotle's ethical theory, give examples of what it means to be a good person according to Aristotle, and explain Aristotle's notion of friendship. Aristotle wrote a great deal about how to live a good life. <clears throat> Happiness was an important feature in his ethics. And that's why in the module two discussion forum, you've been asked to describe what your life of 99 years would look like if you looked back and focused on the happiest moments and, and when you were flourishing. For Aristotle, happiness was human flourishing. He called it eudaimonia. That's the Greek word for flourishing. It was each person being the best they could possibly be. To, Anita, to do this, Aristotle believed that the person needs to be virtuous. So Aristotle's ethics focuses on the person. Deontological ethics focuses on the act and utilitarianism focuses on the consequence, how much good or bad is created from the act. So that's how Aristotle's virtue ethics different. Uh, he's looking at the person, it, it, is someone a virtuous person? And if they're a virtuous person, well, that'll be shown by the virtuous actions. So many virtues and their vices are actually at play within one's interactions with his or her friends. You know how your friends can be a good or bad influence. So that's why we're going to talk about friendship. The first form of friendship is utility. It's a very shallow level of friendship. Many would describe such relationships as an acquaintance or a business connection. This would be the type of relationship you have with your favorite cashier at Target or the barista at Starbucks, somebody that you do business with and you know, you chat with them and you might even say, how's your son doing or look at pictures of their pets. But once you stop going to that business and the usefulness is gone, so is a friendship. That's why it's called utility. So utility is the first level of friendship that we're looking at, Juanita, and, and it's kind of shallow. Can you think of an example of someone in your life who would fit into this level of friendship as usefulness? Um colleagues not some colleagues <laughs> yes because you know if they quit the job you probably would not keep when, up with them. yeah we'll never see them again never hear from them again yeah okay good so let's look at the second level of friendship which is pleasure or enjoyment 
you enjoy the company of the other person and they enjoy your company. With this level of friendship, you share mutual interests. This might be a friend that you go play cards with or somebody you go bowling with, you go to concerts or sporting events with. Many of the relationships considered friendships in contemporary society fall into this category. I can think of a time when I used to go to baseball games with my coworkers. Um, we used to go check out a new Chinese restaurant after work if it opened up. Sometimes we would go see, you know, a movie that just came out. You know, we'd get together and do things like that after work. And I think that would fall into that level of, of pleasure or enjoyment because you enjoy the company of the other person because you share mutual interests. Can you think of someone, Twinita, in your life that would fall into this second level of friendship? Uh, yeah. I used to do hair. I had some beauty salons. So a lot of my clients um, fall into this category of friendship. They'll come out and support any events I'm, I'm throwing or giving and vice versa. If they invite me to, you know, a wedding or birthday party or something like that, because I did their hair supply the service, then I'll go with them. So I think they'll fall into that category. Okay. That's a great example. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this third level of friendship. For Aristotle, the third level of friendship is the highest level, and it's what he calls a true friendship, which is based on mutual well-being. And he believes these true friendships are very rare. There are elements of the other two types of friendship, but the foundation is so different because each friend enjoys the other person's company and their character. The well-being of the friend takes priority over your own well-being. And one's self-awareness goes beyond his or herself. This true friendship aids in your ability to reach happiness because the friend encourages you to be a better, more virtuous person. When I think about true friendship, I think of family members that I'm really close to, people that I've known all my life who have been there, you know, supporting me, like my older brother. You know, these are just people that they would put your own well-being above theirs. And I think of a few people that I went to high school with that I've known for 40 some years. And um, that friendship is also a situation where I would put their own well-being over my own because I care so deeply about them. And Aristotle believes that you can only have a true friendship between two virtuous people. Because only two truly good people are able to care for the other for the sake of that other person. Do you agree with that, Twinita? Do you think you have to have two virtuous people to have true friendship? Um, to a certain extent, because <laughs> Like you said in your example, um, family. I have some family members that's, you know, not as virtuous, not as reliable, not as supportive, but me on the other hand, I was still, you know, I wouldn't like do them the way they do me or, you know. So to a certain extent, in a perfect world, yeah, but you know, everybody's not virtuous. <laughs> Yeah, and I think how do you define virtue? How do you define good? You know, yeah. you definitely know about people who yeah. start hanging around the wrong crowd and they're getting arrested, they're drinking and driving, they're yeah. smoking, they're doing all this bad stuff, and then their life goes bad. So I think that's why Aristotle looked at, you know, friendship because a lot of people feel that, you know, success or failure is defined by who the people you are, who you're hanging around with, you know, because those people have such a big influence on your psyche, you know, and yeah. in trust. I mean, if I had a, a true friend, someone that I've known all my life, recommend that I do something, I would think long and hard about, you know, maybe I really need to do this. You know, if, if that, that good friend of me says, no, you're wrong, you're wrong for believing that and you need to believe this, I would have to think long and hard, you know, about whether or not that person is right. Um, because Definitely. if they're a true friend, yeah, you you start to realize they're looking out for my own best interest, right? Yeah. And, and I need to listen to that person. So 
I think there is some correlation between friendship and virtue. Yeah. So let's talk about virtue ethics. What is virtue ethics? Virtue ethics says that moral conduct is something that emanates from a person's virtues, from her moral character, not from obedience to moral law. So Kant's deontological ethic was all about obey moral laws. Don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, don't kill, things like that. But virtue ethics is not focused on any obedience to moral laws. Instead, virtue ethics asks the question, what kind of person should I be? Should I be an excellent person? Should I be a good person? A virtue is a stable disposition to act and feel according to some ideal or model of excellence. For Aristotle, it's a deeply embedded character trait. So, Twanita, how would you know if someone is virtuous? How would you be able to tell? Um, I guess... Maybe hard times would probably really reflect um, trials and adversity and stuff like that will really reflect a person's true character. But um, on the surface, I don't think you really can tell until you spend time with a person. Even if it's a little bit of time, you could kind of get a feel for them and kind of get a feel for the type of person they are, their character. Right, because, you know, when times are good, everybody can smile in your face. Oh, exactly. But what about when times are bad and you lose your job and you don't have any money, you don't have any gas, you don't have a car? Is that right. person still there supporting you, helping right. you? That's a true friend, right? Because, again, yeah. they care more about your well-being than their own. And um, I think for Aristotle, it's it's through actions because... If someone is virtuous, you'll be able to look at what they do. Are they donating to charity? Are they giving to other people? Are they respectful of other people? Are, are they respectful of the disabled? Do they respect elderly people? Do they hold the door open for someone in a wheelchair? I think for Aristotle, um, a virtuous person is somebody that acts with virtue. And you can tell if somebody's virtuous by what it is that they're doing, right? You would watch what they do. Um, because again, it's this belief that actions, you know, really reflect your intentions and who you are. Because if you're really rich and you're generous, you wouldn't hold on to all your money, right? If you're rich and generous, we would see that person out there like Bill Gates, giving money to charity, you know, trying to build communities in Africa, like Oprah, building schools in Africa, finding ways to have more sanitation in Africa. Or, you know, people that over here are trying to, you know, find new ways to feed the children, to feed the homeless. If a person is virtuous, according to Aristotle, it will show in their actions, right? They will act with virtue and some model of excellence. So what are the moral virtues? What do you, what, what do you think of virtue? What's an example of a virtue? Think of a student when you're in school. How would you know if a student in grade school or high school is showing a virtue? What would an eth what would an, eth an ethical virtue be that a student might show? Um, participating in class. <laughs> yeah, good participation, submitting assignments on time, coming to class on time being nice to the teacher. So I think that goes into, into conscientiousness, right? Mm -hmm. So the module three written assignment asks you to create your own help wanted ad in which you list five virtues that an ideal job applicant would have. So what do you think a good employee, what kind of virtues would a good employee have, Tonita? Um the things listed in your slide. <laughs> um, you can use that or anything else. Yeah, definitely um, honesty, um, reliability. Good. My job, I work in healthcare now, so they want you to be reliable. Um, 
think I got a, a brain block right now. <laughs> That's okay. I think reliable is important, right? They need to show up to work and be there to help the yeah. patients. Mm -hmm. Courteous, right? Have you ever seen, I've had family members, you know, with long hospital stays and I go in there and they're telling me, oh, this so -and person in so-and-so bed wanted to get a bath and the nurses were outside giggling. They didn't want to touch this old man, you know, oh, man. Or, or things like that. Or, you know, when it's time for the patient to get the medicine and the nurses are out in the hall talking to their boyfriends or looking pictures of their pets, you know, yeah. I've seen that. I'm sure you have too. Oh yeah. And, you know, and then that's a person that's not being very virtuous because they're not reliable, right? Yeah. They're not conscientious. Yeah. They're not loyal. <laughs> Because you compassionate. Be there you go. Yeah. Good. Compassionate, you know, mm -hmm. and, the, and we're in a period of time right now where there's a shortage of healthcare workers there. There's a shortage of um, people to work in most industries, period. So mm -hmm. when you find a compassionate healthcare worker, a CNA a nurse's assistant, I'm always blown away. And I'm like, you know, thank you because it's, it's so wonderful. What does that be? It's so wonderful to actually see a person that is really compassionate. Again, most doctors, I do not feel are very compassionate. Again, this is based on my own observations of, um, of my own health care and having family members, you know, who had extended stays in hospitals. And um, what it is I saw was that one doctor out of 10 was truly compassionate and mm -hmm. truly put the patient's needs above anything else. Everybody else was just in a hurry to get out of that room and off to the next room. Have you yeah. seen that? Oh yeah, a lot of doctors, um, they don't work well under pressure, you know, and they might have a workload of a hundred patients, you know, within a two out, a two, uh, two shifts in a day. And, you know, instead of just taking that load off, they take on all those patients and then they don't know how to work under that pressure. And, and it shows, it even shows with the staff, you know, we doctors blow up at us all day, every day because of something that, you know, they missed or that, that they messed up. So yeah, that's definitely true. Good, good. And, and my own personal experience, I was a medical malpractice attorney back in the 90s and, and the first case i dealt with was you know pretty much a a patient came into the hospital with high blood pressure the doctor did not properly treat the patient and you know i i think that still happens now a patient comes into the er with high blood pressure and you know they're told to sit there and wait you know they're told to do this told to do that and and it, and again ethics when it comes to health care is really about, you know, the standard of care that's required and putting the patient first. And obviously there's a relationship between law and ethics because if a patient is not treated ethically and, and the patient gets worse or dies, that, that's a, a medical negligence lawsuit. Um, there've been situations where a patient went into the hospital to get their left leg amputated and the doctor amputated the right leg. That's a serious, serious issue, um, something like that. But again, when a doctor's in a hurry, they're rushing from room to room. They're uh, independent contractors, right? They're not working. They're not staffed in that particular hospital. They're just independent contractors. And then the communication, right, is not, is not there. They're not communicating with the staff. I've been in hospitals at times when really the head nurse was the run running the floor. Have you have you been especially late at night when all the doctors are gone? Isn't it the head nurse really that runs? Yeah, everything? it's the it's the head nurse at most facilities, especially major um um corporations, like major like hospitals versus doctors' offices or practices. But yeah, hospitals, it's the nurses that's doing pretty much everything. Absolutely, and um. And how about the use of technology in healthcare? You would think that we would find a way to use that technology to enter in all of the patient's records and information. So if the patient comes into, do you work in a hospital? I'm actually a float. So I float okay. from different offices, um, Northwestern University um, and hospital downtown Chicago. 
So I float between, <laughs> we have up to like a hundred different accounts. Some are private practices, but like you said, um, we're independent contractors, the lab. So I, I work with a lot of different ones. Good. Wouldn't it be helpful if, since we have all this modern technology, Twanita, if all of the patient's records were centralized so that when you went from facility A to facility B, and the patient goes from facility A, maybe the patient is in the hospital in January, and then in um, February, the patient has to go to a different hospital. Wouldn't it be helpful if all of those records were centrally located so that, you know, when you start with a patient, you're not starting out with, okay, what's your name? Okay, have you ever been to the hospital before? Okay, uh, what are your um, conditions? Wouldn't it be nice if all that was kept in a central location? Where you it, access it would that. be it definitely would be nice. <laughs> it would be practical, but because of um the HIPAA laws, you know, it's hard, especially with technology, because now we got the spam and we got the um the hackers and all of that stuff. So it's kind of hard, but like as far as the labs, we do have a central place for any lab work for a patient if they went to any of these accounts or anybody that's affiliated with like Northwestern Hospital and it's thousands overall. So the lab work can always be seen, but like with the diagnosis, it, it can't. And from hospital yeah. to hospital, it can't. Excellent. And I think that's a serious moral dilemma because you're wasting a lot of time if you're in a in a hospital and you don't know anything about this patient when all you needed to do was turn the computer on and pull up their records yeah. and i'm and i'm sure there's some way that they can just encrypt the records and you know have that coding available you know through a mutual system between hospitals and i think eventually we'll, we'll get to that point mm -hmm. you know maybe with um all of the facial recognition and the touch screens that yeah. i think at some point the patient will be they'll be able to use a fingerprint yeah. maybe to pull up a patient's all of the patient's records because they can certainly do that with controlled substances to make sure that the patient is not getting a controlled substance from two different doctors at the same time right, right. they have yeah. a way of looking that up mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it would really it'd be in the patient's best interest if all of their medical records could be accessible to healthcare providers without this big, okay, now you got to sign this form and then we got to get your records request and we got to transfer it and then we got to wait a week and then we got to mm -hmm. see what your records were. You know, if you're dealing yeah. with a patient you sign and release forms. <laughs> over and over again every time you go to a different hospital and sometimes at the same hospital you're like well, i was just here last week don't you have that record no let's just do everything again you know fill out this form i was just here last week it seems like it would be more efficient and more um ethical to, for doctors to keep that information on file it would save time it would be more efficient and it would lead to better treatment of the patient because you would have all of their medical history in front of you by accessing a computer and isn't that what computers are for you know to to benefit the greater good of society <laughs> but yeah that that's one of my pet peeves where i really see you know a problem and i'm glad to know that you know with the lab records and the companies that you're working with that 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 is a centralized database that's accessible wherever you go. Okay, well, let's talk about um, some of the challenges with virtue ethics. One of the criticism is how should you act? Appeals to a virtuous character without reference to any principle of duty may not be able to give us useful guidance in deciding what to do. And let's look at the healthcare situation. Um, suppose a patient is terminally ill with cancer. Um, how would um, a, a, a virtuous doctor know whether or not to recommend chemotherapy or, or to not recommend chemotherapy? If someone is, uh, um, if, is uh, if someone is on life support and the doctor appeals to virtue ethics, would a virtuous doctor pull the plug on the patient or would the virtuous doctor hold on knowing that they might wake up? I mean, what do you, how would a virtuous person resolve moral dilemmas like that? 
they will really have to <laughs> um, really have to put some thought into it, especially like in in the medical field, especially because like you said, malpractice and not only lawsuits, but somebody's life is in your hands. Um, so you will have to definitely like maybe weigh out the odds. And your yeah, example. and that is um yeah that that weight that's consequentialism. That would be looking at utilitarian ethics, which would say what would be the correct course of action based on the outcome, right? The pros and cons. If I do this, you know, will the patient live? What's the likelihood that if I keep holding on with life support, the patient will live? And uh, what which way would minimize suffering, right? Um, mm -hmm. To give chemotherapy or not? That's a uh, that's utilitarian ethics. But see, Aristotle's virtue ethics rejects all of that. So that how what how would a virtuous person make the decision without appealing to pros and cons or without looking at the patient's right to die or the patient's um, you know do not resuscitate or you know the patient's um, advanced directives? So without a reference to duty based ethics or looking at the pros and cons. I'm not sure that virtue ethics will tell someone how to act in some of these hard cases. All right. Know, that's why I'm over here thinking like virtue, <laughs> virtual ethics. Like what what would a doctor do in that situation? Because it's based on the person, right? What kind of person would he be? Or should he be? Yes. And I think a virtual, a, a virtuous person might still decide that it's time to pull the plug or an individual who has cancer might be virtuous and still reject chemotherapy. Yeah. I can tell you, I personally, if I had cancer, I would not do chemotherapy. I've got some relatives also who have some medical conditions and, and they refuse to get those treated, believing that the better outcome might be not to, to go that route because it's going to be so painful all your hair is going to fall out, you know, you're going to get all this radiation, X, Y, Z. I'm telling you right now, if I find that one day that I have cancer, I'm just going to have to let it, you know, work it out some other natural way, you know, with vitamins or <laughs> right. <laughs> trying to eat more salads. I'm not <laughs> going through chemotherapy, nor am I going to be cut open. You know, right. it's just because for me, I, I that, I would use utilitarian ethics and just say, well, what would minimize suffering? You know, mm -hmm. going through chemo is very painful. Now, I believe if someone has children, that decision might be different. I had an uncle, I think he had four or five kids. He needed a blood transfusion, but he's a Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. So what would you do in that situation? What what would what should the doctor recommend? The patient's a Jehovah's Witness, but they need a drug blood transfusion to live. Jehovah's Witnesses believe once the blood leaves the body, you know, the, the devil gets in it or what and it's and it's not good. So Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe you can get a blood transfusion. Well then in that case, <laughs> the doctor should put that man's wishes <laughs> ahead of everything else. <laughs> sure. That would be looking at it from a deontological, a duty base, because the patient really? has a right to decide, right? Um, that That's the patient's right. So duty-based ethics looks at your rights, your duties, and the universal moral laws. So the patient has a right to die and a right to refuse medical treatment. So that's deontology. Utilitarianism will says, what outcome has the best, you know, what, what course of action leads to the greater good? For me, in my uncle's situation, he had four or five kids. So to me, he should have gotten the blood transfusion because that would have been the best decision for his children to have their father there to provide for them until they turn 18. But no, he did not get the blood transfusion and died and left his wife as a single woman raising these kids. Mm. So to me, his decision was wrong in the eyes of utilitarianism because that did not lead to the best consequence, even though he had a right to, to, to refuse medical treatment. You know, again, I think a lot of it depends on what moral theory are you going to apply, you know? So according to virtue ethics, then what would the outcome have been? And see, that's the problem. That's the weakness of virtue ethics. 
We yeah. don't know because right. a virtuous person <laughs> could believe in sticking to their religious beliefs or a virtuous person could say, I better do what's in the best interest of my children, you know, yeah. and that's the criticism of virtue ethics 20. Okay. That's it right there. I don't think that virtue ethics tells you how to act when you're faced with a moral dilemma. Yeah. I don't. And that's why I prefer duty-based ethics or utilitarianism because duty-based ethics, you look at the patient's rights and the duties and you look at universal moral rules Mm -hmm. Um, and then utilitarianism just says, weigh the pros and cons, what leads to the best course of action. And I truly believe my uncle should have gotten a blood transfusion. Yeah. He would have lived. He would have seen his kids grow up. He would have been able to provide for them rather than my aunt having to do everything by herself, you know? Yeah. So the medical community is really faced with a lot of moral dilemmas, what, like uh, COVID-19. So now Pfizer's vaccine has been approved by the FDA. So I know a lot of people refuse to get it because they were holding out for that. They're like, well, it hasn't been approved by the FDA. I've heard that. So now Pfizer's vaccine has been approved by the FDA. Does the government now have the authority to mandate that? Would that be ethical for the government to say it's been approved by the FDA? It's now mandatory for all adults. We won't mess with children because I don't think that all the, the, the data is there. Um, but for adults, and and I'm only looking at Pfizer because I don't I know that the other vaccines are not as effective. <laughs> so mm. Pfizer has been approved by the FDA. Is it morally correct now for the government to mandate that, Juanita? <sighs> this is just <laughs> an ongoing debate everywhere. <laughs> I I feel like um, I feel like yeah. Right. And yeah. I would agree with you to the extent that we're applying utilitarian ethics. Yeah. Because utilitarian ethics says look at the outcome for everyone Everybody. involved. Yeah. The outcome for everyone involved is for everyone to be vaccinated. And that would minimize the risk of COVID spreading. It would minimize the severity should somebody be um, exposed to the um, to COVID or the Delta variant. People who have been vaccinated and, and are exposed are much more likely to be able to just deal with COVID at home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they'll be sick for maybe two or three weeks. And then you don't have to be in a hospital because you have some immunity built up from the vaccine. Right. Mm -hmm. So utilitarian ethics would justify. And I think the president already knows that he has the authority to mandate the vaccine. And I read today it's being mandated for everyone in the military. Yeah. And I've had a lot of students in the military say, I ain't getting it. Well, now it's mandated. <laughs> and I just got an email this morning from my job. It's now mandated. <laughs> yeah. Now mandatory. Yes. I personally have been vaccinated. Um, I looked at utilitarian ethics and I said, what course of action is going to have the best outcome? Right. Well, the Pfizer vaccine is 95% effective. Um, the likelihood of a side effect is one out of 2.5 million. Mm -hmm. That's a very, 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 very low number. You know, when I got the vaccine, I did not even feel the needle going in. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are afraid of needles. I've heard that oh, I'm scared of needles. It, it does not hurt. Getting the vaccine doesn't hurt. You don't feel it. Now the next day, your arm feels a little bit sore, but yeah. that soreness will go away. And by the third day, you're okay. So that's how I made my decision. I, I applied utilitarian ethics. If I had applied duty-based ethics, well, I have a right to refuse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I probably wouldn't have done it. And I, and I have friends who too were like, I'm not going to get it. But once they saw the benefit and they weighed the benefit versus mm -hmm. the suffering and that, and that's what you're seeing now is people, you know, the majority of the people who are in the hospital you know, in intensive care did not get the vaccine and yeah. uh, that's the suffering. So that, that, if you use utilitarianism, 
It really will help you make a workable moral decision as opposed to using emotivism, right? Which is, I'm just afraid of needles or some other reason why. So I think again, now that we've got the FDA approval, we're going to see more and more people forcing it. I read today, nobody can go to an NFL football game, at least where I live, unless without being vaccinated, you can't even go to a football game. So, yeah. and why? Because that is in the interest of the greater good to yeah. protect the players, the attendees, so that people can go to the game and reduce the likelihood of getting COVID or the Delta variant. They did not make the decision to be mean. No, they yeah. use utilitarian ethics to say, all right, this vaccine has been approved by the FDA. The likelihood of anybody having side effects is, is three and two point million versus the many, many, many benefits. And they weigh the benefits, the pros versus the cons. And the weight was that it was more beneficial for people to have it and to mandate it. And I think that that's what we're going to see going forward. So, yeah. and I mean, we, we talked about that in week one, and now we have more information to help us do the utilitarian calculus. We didn't even have the fact that it was approved by the FDA when we were talking right. about it two weeks ago. Yeah. So more information can help you make a better moral decision. And uh, I think that's what we're gonna see is more people are going to be getting the vaccine. Yeah. Huh. So um, let's hit one or two more concepts before we move on to Buddhism. One is in, in, in Aristotle's virtue ethics is the notion of the golden mean. For Aristotle believed that the happy life was a balance and a moderation of all things. The golden mean would be a balance between two behavioral extremes. You could think of somebody with courage as being the midpoint between somebody who is foolhardy or overly courageous and somebody who is a coward. So foolhardiness, bullying, I guess would be on one end of the extreme. The other extreme would be a coward and the moderation would be just a person that has normal amount of courage. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like gluttony versus starvation. Neither one of those is virtuous, right? right. But the virtuous person is the one who eats just enough. And, and that's gonna be something different for everybody. But that would be the golden mean, right? It's the midpoint between excessive gluttony and deficit starving yourself and finding that midpoint. So for Aristotle, the virtuous life, the happy life is moderation in all things. So let's talk about our second moral theory, which is our first Eastern moral theory, which is Buddhism. And we're going to see some overlap between virtue ethics and Buddhism, mainly the, the path that you, that you need to be on to become virtuous. So in Buddhism, the moral virtue is the foundation of this, it's being on a spiritual path. And I've known a few people that are, that are into Zen Buddhism. Um, Buddhism originated in India. It is based on the life and teaching of Siddhartha Gautama who lived around the same time as Socrates, 500 BC. The Buddha grew up in luxury as a prince. His father tried to keep him from experiencing any suffering. But like many people who were wealthy, wealthy they give up their princely life to try to reduce the suffering of others. And I just realized Prince Harry is a prime example of someone like this who grows up in luxury as a prince, but ultimately rejects that lifestyle instead to try to find a way to keep people from experiencing suffering. And this is what the Buddha did. The Buddha did a more extreme version of it. Um, We'll talk about some of the ideas in Buddhism, enlightenment, karma, skillfulness, meditation, harmlessness, compassion in the Dalai Lama. So what is enlightenment? Well, enlightenment is the ultimate go goal of Buddhists to achieve enlightenment and escape samsara. Samsara is a cycle of suffering. So the goal of Buddhism is to escape suffering and to achieve enlightenment. 
and that is also like nirvana. For Aristotle, it was eudaimonia, it was the ultimate happiness. Karma, we've all heard about bad karma. What causes bad karma, Twanita? Um, when you do bad things. Okay, right. It's like it, it, when if somebody does something bad, it comes back to bite them. And I've seen this many times, you know, and it, it can be explained also by Newton's laws of physics, which basically says for any action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So when somebody puts a negative energy out into the world, a negative statement that comes back at you, that is basic, most, the most basic physics, but in Buddhism, it's just called karma. Skillful means good karma is generated by acting skillfully. Bad karma is generated by acting unskillfully. And I can, again, make an analogy to the healthcare field. When I see a nurse who is really acting skillfully, I'm always very respectful of that person. The nurse is showing compassion. She's right on time with the patient's medicine. She's there by the patient's bedside with the meals, doing everything very skillfully. And that creates a good karma. And I think that that good energy can actually help to heal the patient, putting that good energy out there. And it's also, again, what comes back at you. What happens if a, if a nurse acts, you know, unskillfully, Twanita? Oh, if a nurse acts unskillfully, then it'll come back to her <laughs> in bad karma. Um, it definitely, like, we're not allowed to talk about religions or anything like that, but... I totally agree with energy, with physics, even with this concept behind Buddhism. Um, when you're nice to people and they they appreciate, especially if they're sick on their, you know, deathbed or not feeling well, they really appreciate that. I've received or been offered so many different things. Like I've been offered scholarships to go back to school. I've been offered like a lot of things from a lot of patients because you never know who these people are that's in your presence so just being respectful being kind trying to be patient even if you're working under duress yourself you know don't let that be whatever going on in your personal life or your work day be a reflection of how you treat people and that good energy always comes back as good karma for me and then i've seen colleagues that just come in every day with a horrible attitude and I've seen horrible things happen to them <laughs> so yes that's a great example and and also the positive energy that you give to the patient studies have shown patients who are in a good mood families are coming by and visiting them um, they're getting gifts they're getting more attention those are the patients that might heal faster People who are happier, the immunity gets boosted because of the endorphins that are in your brain. Actually, happiness can boost immunity. Depression is much more likely to lead to illness. So that really, that good karma and that good energy, you know, it can be healing, you know, as well as is having it come back to you. So it is, it, it's this, this idea of Buddhist ethics really seems to have some validity, you know, when you think about you know, ethics in healthcare, good karma is generated by acting skillfully. So let's talk about the path to enlightenment. It is a combination of meditation, wisdom, and morality. The better the meditation, the clearer your mind will be, the better you can understand the wisdom. The more wisdom you have, the better you're able to make good moral choices. And again, when your mind is clear, your mind works better for meditation. And that is the path to enlightenment for Buddhists. It is the wisdom, the meditation, and the morality. Buddhists have to follow five laws. Abstain from harming and instead show compassion. Abstain from stealing and instead give. Abstain from the misuse of sensual pleasures Abstain from false speech. Instead, tell the truth. Abstain from intoxicants that cloud the mind. Instead, be mindful. Again, you can think of um, 
a pilot who comes to work intoxicated, is that moral? Is that ethical? No, not at all. A doctor who comes to work intoxicated. No, that's not moral. No, because I mean, and it is a problem in, in many professions of, of intoxication and alcohol abuse. And uh, we can see <clears throat> when if, if the intoxicants are clouding the mind, the person will not, you know, be able to make the good decisions that they need to be when their mind is clear and they're aware. Loving kindness is a concept known as meta, the feeling of happiness for all beings, warding off hatred and fear to be expressed to all beings like a mother's love for her child. Again, that belief in love and compassion is strong in Buddhism. Let's talk about the Buddha and the path to enlightenment. So a Bodhavista is a person who is destined for enlightenment. A person becomes a Bodhavista by arousing the mind for enlightenment, vowing to attain supreme enlightenment for the sake of all beings. And when the Bodhavista finally achieves that supreme enlightenment, that is Nirvana. The Bodhavista does not aspire to leave samsara until all beings are saved. So again, it's the idea of acting not just for your own good or being concerned with your own good, but being concerned with the suffering of others. So how did the Buddha find the path? <laughs> In his search to overcome suffering, the Buddha lived a very frugal life, refraining from the use of worldly goods. In this endeavor, he practiced such an extreme level of fasting that he nearly died of starvation. Have you ever heard of any religions or any people fasting, Twanita? Yeah, my mom is a Baptist and I'm the youngest of 10 children. My mom and dad was together until the day my father passed away. So they come from the South um, <laughs> and it's deeply embedded in them, uh, their religion. And yeah, they fast and pray. Um, I don't think it's as disciplined as like maybe who else fast? Maybe Muslims fast, but they fast and pray and um, they'll give up. Like my mom, she's like, I'm giving up bread. <laughs> so she won't eat bread for like a week or potatoes or anything with starch or anything. So yeah, they, 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 and my father, my father didn't, but my mom, she still does. And she's 80. Yes, and again, studies show now that fasting is very good for the body for a certain period of time, you know, whether it be for 12, a 12-hour 12 fast or however long, you know, it, it's recommended. It, it, it's actually could be good for the body. But yes, it's the idea that through that sacrifice for the Buddhists, through the sacrifice, um, you achieve spirituality by giving up something and sacrificing something and suffering for the Buddha to live this frugal life and to suffer until he can actually achieve enlightenment. So one day the Buddha was um, fasting and he accepted a bowl of rice offered to him by a young girl. And he realized this is not the path I'm looking for. He went into a deep meditation and he found the path that he was looking for and it was called the middle way, similar to the golden mean in Aristotle's virtue ethics. The middle way again, is the path between two extremes. Gluttony and starving, the Buddha realizes that starving is not the way. Instead, the best way to be on the path is, is the middle way. So let's talk about your module three assignments. We have a discussion forum, which asks you to present a reflection of your life that highlights your view of flourishing. Be sure to submit um, the uh, the first discussion post by Tuesday or yesterday and the reply post by um, Saturday. The discussion forum will end on Sunday. You also have a live session question, which asks you what is the golden mean? And you just need to submit that using the Dropbox. That's due on Sunday. And then you have a written assignment, which is asking you to create a one page help wanted ad 
for an entry level marketing position. And no APA is required for this assignment. I'm going to show you a sample help wanted ad that was created by a student last year. I think this is really good, although there are a hundred different ways you could do a help wanted ad. Um, this particular student chose a layout that was very professional. So in the assignment added up marketing firm is looking for entry level marketing professionals to join the team. And um, it asks you to create a bold attention grabbing title and the student has building careers one higher time added up marketing firm. It's important that no one changes the name of the job or the title of the company It's added up marketing firm and the position is entry level marketing professionals. This person um, has described the job. And most importantly, the five ethics that the ideal candidate must possess. Punctual, reliable, responsible, compassionate, integrity, honest, ability to communicate, must have the courage to take on challenging tasks. So that's more than five virtues. And then finally, the directions for how to apply for the job. So any questions, Tonita, about how to create this help wanted ad? It can be done in Microsoft Word. Somebody wants to get fancy and use Publisher or Microsoft PowerPoint, that's fine, but you can actually do the whole thing in Microsoft Word. I believe Microsoft Word also has templates probably for, for help wanted ads. Can do, you know, cut and paste pictures and, and um, embed those within Microsoft Word also. So any questions, Tonita? No, no questions. Well, thank you so much for attending the module three live session. I really appreciate your participation and your insights as a healthcare professional telling us about virtue and what's going on in the healthcare field is very important. Yeah. And uh, please just remember everyone at home to submit the correct answer to the live session question along with your help wanted ad by Sunday, August 29th. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm just an email away and I try to check those emails every day. I will get back to you with any questions. Any questions for me, Juanita? Nope, none at all. Thank you so much. Have a great week. You as well. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Stay cool. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Thanks.